My name is Edith Bowling Wilson, and my family was not wealthy, but we were prominent. I am a direct descendant of Pocahontas, and my older brother Roth was named for Pocahontas' husband, John Roth. <coughs> my great-great-grandmother was sister to Thomas Jefferson, and I'm also related to Martha Washington and Robert E. Lee. My father's family came from Bedford County, Virginia, where before the Civil War, they had a bustling plantation. But after the war, they, like almost everyone, lost almost everything. But my father was more fortunate than most because he had attended the University of Virginia to study law. And his father had taken in payment of a debt this very property right here in Whitfield. So in 1862, my father brought my mother and two young children to Whitfield to open a law practice. When they got here, the place was in shambles because it had been used as a Confederate hospital. But very soon, my mother had made a warm, loving home. I am the seventh of 11 children. Sometimes we had as many as 20 people living upstairs with us. But <laughs> that's true. Both of my grandmothers lived with us, and I was my grandmother Bowling's favorite and quite spoiled by her. <laughs> but that didn't mean my life was easy because grandmother Bowling was an exacting taskmaster. And she was also an invalid, and I was her primary caregiver. Grandmother Bowling also brought with her to our house 26 canaries. <laughs> yes, 26 little yellow birds. And guess who had to take care of them? I did. <laughs> but my life was not all hard. My grandmother Bowling taught me almost everything that I knew. She taught me to sew, to knit, to crochet, to embroider, and to fit dresses. But more importantly, she taught me to read and to write. You realize that I only had two years of formal education. When I was 15, I went to the Martha Washington College in Abingdon, Virginia to study music. But it was very cold there and I was so homesick. I only stayed a year. The following year, I went to the Powell School in Richmond, Virginia, and I loved it there, but money was scarce, so my parents felt that it was more important to educate my three younger brothers. So my school years ended. When I was 18, I left Whitfield and went to Washington to visit my sister Gertrude, and that changed my life forever. It was there that I met Norman Galt. Norman's family owned Galt and Brothers, the most prestigious jewelry store in the D.C. area. After a four-year courtship, Norman and I married, but unfortunately, after only 12 years of marriage, Norman passed away, leaving me with that business to run, plus the responsibility of my mother, my sister, and three younger brothers. I really did not know what I was going to do. This was the lowest point in my life. But remember my grandmother Bowling say, say, now Edith, I hate can't, and you can do anything if you try. And try I did. I learned everything I could about that jewelry store, and I hired our wonderful manager. He continued to work for us, and I ran that jewelry store quite successfully. During that time, I traveled extensively. I went to Europe several times, sometimes to buy gems for the jewelry store, sometimes just to travel. Uh, I loved going to the opera. I loved the theater. I was the first woman in Washington, D.C. to own and operate an electric car. Now, by 1915, I had been a widow for seven years, and I felt the need to answer to no one but myself. At that time, the war over in Europe was just beginning, and our president, Woodrow Wilson, had lost his first wife, and he was devastated. 
as was his uh, first cousin, Helen Burns. Helen lived at the White House. She was uh, President Wilson's first cousin, and uh, she was Mrs. Wilson's secretary, personal secretary. Now, although I had nothing to do with uh, Washington politics, I was a shopkeeper after all. I, I didn't have time for that. I was good friends with Dr. Carrie Grayson. Dr. Grayson was the president's personal physician, and he was my good friend because he was in love with my good friend and traveling companion, Altrude Gordon, so I saw him often. He kept saying to me, you need to meet Helen Bones. You'd like her very much, and she needs a friend like you. <laughs> I told him, not the least bit interested in meeting Helen Bones. I had never had anything to do with the White House, and I wasn't about to start now. Well, he paid no attention to me. And here he came to my house one afternoon for tea, bringing with him not only Helen Bones, but Mrs. Eleanor McAdoo, the president's daughter. And you know, they were really quite nice, very easy to talk to, and I found that we had a lot in common. So Helen and I began taking long walks together. We always ended up back at my house for tea. But on this one March day, she insisted that we go to the White House for tea. She said that the president and Dr. Grayson were playing golf and there would be no one there. Little did I know, when I turned the corner to get on the elevator, there stood my fate. Well, we all had a big laugh about it and Helen invited the president and Dr. Grayson to have tea with us and we had a wonderful time. They invited me to stay for dinner, but I declined, of course. But the next time I was invited to the White House for dinner, I accepted. <laughs> and I accepted many more invitations to the White House. Right from the very beginning, the president and I had an instant rapport. He knew that he could trust me. He knew that what he told me would go no farther. I had soon stopped thinking about him as the President of the United States. And I had begun thinking about him as my friend. And I was beginning to enjoy our friendship. But he started to pursue a romance. And he was quite persistent. He sent me orchids every day of our courtship. And he wrote the most beautiful love letters, over 250 of them just that summer. Less than six weeks after we met, he asked me to marry him. Of course I said no. I said the first thing that came to my mind, I said, you can't love me because you don't even know me. And besides, it's been less than a year since your wife passed away. Well, he didn't like that very much, but we continued to talk about it. And finally, I said to him, if I have to give you a yes or a no answer right now, my answer is no. He accepted that, but we continued to see each other. His daughters were so happy with the revitalization of their father, but the people in Washington, they were not so happy. Washington is just a small town after all. They felt like the president was spending too much time with me and not enough time on his duties. So I left Washington that summer and I went to New York to visit friends and family. But when I returned to Washington in September and I looked into his eyes, eyes like no other, I knew that I would go to the end of the world with him or for him. Our engagement was announced in the New York Times on October the 7th, 1915. And the following day, the president, my mother and I attended the World Series game in Philadelphia. When we walked into that stadium, the applause was tremendous. I think that the people of the United States were as happy for their president as his daughters were. I had gone from being a modest woman with a small circle of friends 
to be talked about and written about in every newspaper in the United States. And I can't say that I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> we were married at my house on December the 15th, <clears throat> excuse me, December the 18th, you know, when you get older and you forget those things, uh, 1915, uh, and in front of about 50 family members and close friends. And we spent a glorious two weeks at the homestead in Hot Springs, Virginia, before returning to Washington and the rigorous tasks that awaited us. Well, let me tell you about my first experience at the White House. It was for a reception for the Diplomatic Corps. There were over 3,000 people in attendance. Now, I want you to just imagine this. This little girl from Whitfield, Virginia, <laughs> walking into that reception hall while the band on the arm of the President of the United States, while the band played Hail to the Chief. <laughs> oh my goodness, my life had taken another dramatic turn. We quickly fell into a routine. We rose each morning around 6 a.m. and sometimes the President worked until midnight. I was his helpmate, his confidant. I knew about everything that was going on. Not only was, it a, was the war over in Europe escalating, but it was also a re-election year. Now, the president based his re-election campaign on neutrality, but when the Germans broke a truce and bombed several submarines and American lives were killed on April the 6th, 1917, President Woodrow Wilson made the hardest decision he ever had to make. The United States entered the Great War. Almost immediately, the ladies of the cabinet and I took a pledge to live more simply and to buy simple clothing and food. The White House, like most Americans, practiced meatless Mondays, wheatless Wednesdays, and gasless Sundays, and there were victory gardens everywhere. I did a stint with the Red Cross, Helen Bones and I did, um, by sewing surgical gowns and pajamas for the soldiers. By the way, it was we used my sewing machine that I had brought from my house that I had used with my grandmother bowling. Uh, the president's daughters had made great fun of that, uh, but it came in handy during the wartime. I also did a stint with the Red Cross by feeding the troop trains as they passed through Washington. President Wilson and I also put a flock of sheep on the White House lawn. Now, we received much undue criticism for that, you can believe that, but you know, the, the sheep became fascinating and the crowds came, especially on Sunday afternoon, just to watch the sheep graze. And the little sheep did what little sheep do and they multiplied. And it was time to share them. Uh, they auctioned off the White House wool and almost $100,000 was raised for the Red Cross. The things that I did and the things that Americans did as a whole just reinforced the values that I learned right here in my hometown of Whitfield. On November the 11th, 1918, the war ended and almost immediately the President and I and our entourage left for Europe for the peace talks. When we first got there, we were treated like royalty. I was the first First Lady to ever go abroad with the President. But very soon, once the Peace Conference started, uh, the days were long and so grueling, and President Wilson was trying to get his 14 points across. Um, he became ill, but he managed that, and we returned home in June, thinking that the peace treaty would be ratified. But when we got home, we found that the people in the United States were not rallying behind his ideas. So he took, felt like we needed to take a train trip. He didn't feel like it. We took a train trip across country. He gave five or six speeches every day. It was so hot. And you could tell that it was taking a terrible toll on his health. And on our return trip in Colorado, the president fell ill, and we returned to Washington immediately. 
three days after we return, the president suffered a stroke. One arm and one leg were affected, but fortunately his mind was clear. Now, many stories are told about the president's illness. Some are true and some are not some, so true. And some do not put me in a very favorable light. But I want you, my new friends today, <laughs> to know the truth based on my memory and my, um, my journaling. I, I always kept notes of everything that was going on. <clears throat> the very best doctors were summonsed. They said that the president should not resign his position because that was the main reason for him to be living, but he should feel absolutely no stress. Hmm. They suggested that I read and study everything and take only those things of gravest importance to the president. Thus began my stewardship. I read and studied everything that I could. And my only decisions at that time were what I felt were important and what was not, and when to take those things to the president. <laughs> I, again, I received a lot of criticism for doing this. <clears throat> but was I trying to be, as some people said, the first woman president? <laughs> no, was not. Woodrow was my beloved husband, and I was trying to save his life. He survived that ordeal and was able to finish his second term, and then we moved into our beautiful house on S Street, where in 1924, my Woodrow finally found his peace. Now, you may think that because I had nothing to do with politics before I met the president, that I would go back to that way of living. However, that's not the case. In 1928, I was asked to speak at the National Democratic Convention, and there was some talk about my being the vice presidential candidate. Uh, I have been the unofficial leader of the Democratic women. I have known every first lady and I have attended every inauguration. But my main purpose in my life has been to attend every event that has honored my Woodrow and to keep his legacy alive. Now, I have the honor of getting to speak to school groups often and I often, I always, not often, I always leave them with this. For these young people to be proud of their heritage and to be proud of where they're from and to take advantage of every opportunity that comes their way because <laughs> who knows, I never thought I would be first lady. They could be President of the United States, or even the first woman president. I am so proud to call with Bill and with County my home and, I, and Southwest Virginia. And I hope that the people in Southwest Virginia are proud that one of its own has had the honor to be First Lady of the United States. Thank you. Thank you.